son konuşmacısı e, Lawrence van der Maten. E, kendisine e, hoş geldin diyoruz. E, konuşma tabii İngilizce olacak. E, ben de e, Lawrence'ın e, sunumunu e, İngilizce yapmak istiyorum. E, kendisinin de anlaması açısından. E, Lawrence van der Maten is a research director at Facebook AI Research and he leads the New York site. Uh, prior, he worked as an assistant professor at Delft University of Technology uh, and as a postdoctoral researcher at University of California, San Diego. He received his PhD from Tilburg University in 2009. Uh, with collaborators from Cornell University, he won the best paper award at CVPR 2017. He is an editorial board member of IEEE Transactions on Pattern Analysis in Machine Intelligence. And he's regularly serving as area chair for the NeurIPS, ICMN, and CVPR conferences. Lawrence is interested in a variety of topics in machine learning and uh, computer vision. It is also important to note that he is the one proposing one of the most popular dimensionality reduction techniques, uh, namely a T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, TSNE, together with uh, Jeffrey Hinton. Uh, Lawrence, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for your uh, participation. It's great to have you here, and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you, Hamdi. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. I'm really excited to to be with you guys. I'm I'm sorry I cannot be with you in um, in person. Uh, you know, maybe next year I can I can make it out to uh, to Ankara. Um, so what I'll be doing today is I'll try and give a bit of an overview of of some of the work uh, that we're doing at at Facebook AI Research. Um, in working from visual recognition to, to visual understanding. Um, be, before I do that, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Facebook AI research. So we're a, um, a team of around 300 researchers uh, uh, spread across um, you know, six or seven sites uh, across the world. And our goal is to advance the state of the art in AI uh, through open research for the benefit of all. Um, so we operate very much like an, uh, like an academic lab in the sense that uh, all the research that we do gets, uh, gets published um, is sort of curiosity driven. So it's not driven by, uh, by, product, in, uh, by product considerations or, or things like that. Um, and we have a lot of collaborations with, uh, with partners, both, both internally and externally. And you may wonder, like, why is, you know, why is a company like Facebook doing this, right? Like, why are they interested in, in sort of driving AI research forward? And that's because we, um, we believe that, you know, by pushing AI research forward as fast as possible, that can positively uh, benefit Facebook's products and also enable new products. And I want to, to show you a few examples of that just to give you a sense of where you see AI um, in Facebook's products today. Um, so one example is a, uh, a product called Portal. I don't know if it's for sale in, in Turkey yet, uh, but it's been on the, on the market for a little over a year in, in the US, uh, which is basically like a video chat uh, device. And sort of the main feature that it has is that it has this uh, wide view angle camera sitting on top of the device and uh, the, the camera is basically tracking people who are in the, in the frame. And this is allowing the camera to basically do like a software type zoom so that the person who is, uh, uh, who is talking is always in view, right? And so this kind of solved this problem where, you know, if you're maybe chatting to your, your parents or, or grandparents, you know, you may have had this experience where you see like this part of their face or this part of their face. Um, and so that kind of problem is, is solved and, and sort of the core technology here is, um, is tracking of, um, of people, which allows the automatic zoom. I hope the videos are working, by the way, Hamdi. Can you, can you confirm that this worked? It worked, it stopped right now though. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's okay. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, another example is, uh, is Oculus Insight, um, which is a, a virtual reality device uh, that works without external cameras um, and without any wires or anything like that. And basically the way it works is it has a camera on top that is tracking points throughout your room. And it's using this tracking to basically figure out like what is the position of the headset and also like what is the orientation of the headset um, at very high fidelity. 
Um, and so this allows you to, um, without sort of any external tracking, to, um, to sort of create realistic virtual environments. And it's also um, similarly, like the cameras are also tracking the, uh, the handheld devices that you use to interact with, uh, with the environments, right? And so there's actually a lot of computer vision that sits, um, that sits in, a, um, in a product like, like Oculus Insights. Um, a third example that, that you may have seen is, is in uh, translation where if you look at a platform like Facebook, um, over 50% of users have at least one friend who has a different native language. Um, and so what we do is we, we try and translate their posts in order to, uh, to sort of make posts of these friends more accessible to, to everyone. And overall, we serve more than 6 billion uh, post translations every day on Facebook between more than 200 different languages. The last example I want to show you is an example of a, uh, of a product that uh, is, is targeted at uh, visually impaired users and aims to make Facebook more accessible to, to those users. Every day, billions of photos are uploaded to our family of apps. To help open our platform to everyone, we use AI to help describe photos that visually impaired members of our community can't see. Getting ready for tonight's game. Image may contain one or more people, people playing sports, shoes and outdoor. Now, these captions paint a more vivid picture than ever before by using active language. Nikki's starting to get the hang of his smiley. Image may contain one or more people, people riding bicycles, bicycle and outdoor. Our AI can describe someone playing an instrument, eating with their friends, or standing on stage. What a great show last night. Image may contain one person on stage and playing a musical instrument. The future is happening now, and we're just getting started. So, so I think this is a cool uh, example where we're essentially using a, a combination of, uh, of image recognition or image classification with text-to-speech in order to make our products more accessible, right? And so, and so really sort of the, the goal of a, of a team like Facebook AI Research is to uh, to drive AI research forward as fast as we can um, because we believe that that will lead to, to sort of product innovations like, uh, like this. And the best way to do that is to be as open as possible about the research that we do so that other people can, can build on it and, and, and contribute to that research as well. Um, so this last example is a good segue to sort of the first part of, um, of my talk, which, which is about visual recognition. Um, and, you know, as I'm, as I'm sure you're aware over the last, you know, eight years or so, there's been tremendous progress in, um, in visual recognition, uh, largely through the development of, uh, of convolutional networks, um, which are these models that, that basically repeatedly filter the image in order to you know, filter out irrelevant information, uh, but create representations that are increasingly semantic, um, where the final representations produced by the models hopefully contain a lot of semantic information. So information about what is depicted in the, um, in the image. Um, and, you know, there's been tremendous progress in these models of, over the past couple of years. And sort of what has contributed to that progress are, are three main ingredients. Um, so the first ingredient is, is the, um, the development of, of better models, right? Like as we're, as we're playing around and, and, and experimenting with model architectures, you know, we find new, uh, new model architectures that sort of empirically work better. Um, so that's been one, one important uh, uh, aspect, but definitely not the only one. I think, you know, the second main one is, is probably data. Right, the availability of um, of large benchmarks like uh, like ImageNet was really essential to to make these models work. Um, um, in the you know when I was doing my PhD 10, 15 years ago, there was no chance that these models would work just simply because we didn't have the kind of training data that you need in order to uh, to train them. And I think that the third component is is computation. Right, there's been tremendous progress in in the use of, of particular GPUs and, and more recently also uh, uh, dedicated chips like, like TPUs um, for, um, to optimize the computations in these kinds of models, which is really important if you want to you know, scale up these models and, and, and really train them well. 
Now, if you look at computer vision today, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, or like a standard approach to solving a vision problem today is to train a model on a large source data set. Um, so typically this would be uh, the ImageNet data set if you look at academic papers. And then to fine tune this trained model on some smaller target data set. Um, so for instance, if you were interested in building a, a, a bird classification system, what you would do is you would train a, a convolutional network on, on ImageNet first, and then you would fine tune it on a small annotated data set of birds, right? Because annotating millions of birds is probably infeasible. Um, and so these kinds of transfer approaches are, are really, uh, really popular. And this made us wonder about, you know, what is the right, the right source data sets? Like what is the right sort of pre-training task for these kinds of vision models? And in particular, what the question we became interested in is, can we use large amounts of weekly supervised images for pre-training rather than, than something like, like ImageNet? Um, so this is a, a study with a, a bunch of colleagues of mine, including Dhruv, Ross, Fignesh, Kaiming, Manohar, Yishwan, and, and Ashwin. So in this study, what we looked at is uh, uh, hashtag supervision. Um, so here's an example of, uh, of an image. Uh, um, um, and in, in this case, it's an image of a cheesecake and, and the image was annotated by the person who posted it, which in this case was Ross Kershik, um, by a hashtag cheesecake and hashtag birthday. Uh, I think his wife made him the cheesecake for, for his birthday, so, so that's why. And so what you can see is that these, uh, these hashtags, they contain some information about uh, the content of the image. They may not be sort of an exact annotation or an exact description, but they do contain some information. And what's nice about this kind of hashtag supervision is that it's relatively easy to get billions of, of public images and, uh, and hashtags, right? So you can really get large amounts of, um, of these kinds of examples. And compared to something like captions, hashtags are more structured. Um, and in particular, hashtags were often assigned to images to make them searchable. Um, and so they're more likely to, uh, to contain sort of interesting or, or useful information. At the same time, hashtags are not perfect supervision. Um, so here's an example of, of another image. And this image was annotated with hashtag cat, travel, Thailand, and, and family. Um, and, and you see a bunch of problems here. Um, so the first problem is that some hashtags are not visually relevant, right? The hashtag travel is not really sort of visually appearing in this, uh, in this image, even though this was probably a, a travel picture. Other hashtags are not in the photo, right? Like presumably this, this photo was made at some family gathering, but you know, the family is sort of on the other side of the, um, of, of the camera. And so, you know, it's not really visible in the photo. And probably most importantly, there are many false negatives, right? There are many things um, present in the image that are not uh, described by hashtags, right? So things like building or fence, um, et cetera. And so really the question that we, we try to answer in this study is, you know, is scaling up data sets, uh, pre-training data sets, is that sufficient to make up for this noise that you have in, um, in this hashtag supervision? So, so here's the experiment we did. Um, so we basically started from a set of hashtags, uh, which was basically like the set of all WordNet nouns. Um, and we did some tiny pre-processing. Basically, we merged hashtags that we know are sin sets in, in WordNet. So for instance, brown bear and Ursus Arctos um, from WordNet, we know these are, are the same thing. And so we merged these into, into a single uh, target. And then we downloaded all public Instagram images that contains, uh, that have at least one of these hashtags associated with them. So the total set of, of hashtags has about 17,500 uh, hashtags. You, you see the list here. Um, it starts with Artvark, which I think is some weird animal, and it ends with Zicoptera. I have actually no clue what, that's, what that is. Um, and the corresponding set of images has around three and a half billion images. Um, and so, you know, it's really orders of magnitude larger than a data set like, uh, like ImageNet, you know, for comparison, ImageNet, I think has around 1.2 million, uh, training images. And so in, in this case, because we have, uh, uh, this sort of hashtag, because we look at this hashtag supervision, we can train on around three and a half billion images. 
Um, I can actually not show you the images, uh, but you can have a look at them yourself. If you go on, um, on Instagram, you can search for, uh, for hashtags. And so you can basically search for, you know, let's say hashtag brown bear or hashtag crane, um, and you'll get a good sense for, for what the training data looks like. Um, and what you'll see is that the training data is incredibly noisy. Um, uh, there, you know, there's going to be some brown bears, but there's going to be lots of other stuff. And so what we do is we, we try to train uh, modern convolutional networks on this, uh, on this data to try and predict hashtags from the image content. Um, the models that we use are, are so-called ResNext models, um, which are basically ResNet models uh, that use group convolutions um, to sort of be slightly more, uh, more efficient. And the only sort of main change that we make compared to what people typically do on a, on a data set like ImageNet is rather than using a one hot vector to represent the, uh, the label, the target of the image, uh, we use a CFK vector. Um, so what you have to keep in mind is that uh, an image may contain multiple hashtags. And so we're really dealing with a multi-label problem here rather than a single label problem like you typically have in, in ImageNet. And so what we do is basically, you know, we create a vector of, of length K where K is this 17,500, right? Like the number of hashtags. And we put basically one over C um, at every location uh, for, that corresponds to a hashtag that was associated with the image where C is the number of, of hashtags, right? So if an image had two hashtags, then there would be two, you know, one over twos in this C of K uh, vector. Um, and now we train to minimize the multi-class logistic loss between this C of K vector and the predictions of, um, of the models. Um, so, so in practice, most experiments that I'll, that I'll show you are done using a ResNex 101 model, um, 32 times 16B, in case you're, you're familiar with, these, uh, with this particular model family. So, so here are some results. Um, so throughout the results, basically the gray color will correspond to um, standard ImageNet training. Um, so this is sort of the standard approach in which we pre-train on ImageNet and then fine tune on, um, on the target data set. Um, and the purple colors correspond to pre-training on these hashtag supervision tasks um, and then fine tuning on, um, on the target task. And in this case, we pick actually ImageNet as the target task, right? So, um, so, so you know, we pre-train on the hashtags and then we fine tune on, on ImageNet and we measure accuracy on the ImageNet validation set. So what you see in this plot on the, um, on the y-axis is the top one accuracy on, uh, on ImageNet. Um, and so, so, you know, if you train a model like this, you know, using standard ImageNet training, you get an accuracy of around 79.6%. Um, and then these bars, so, so for instance, this bar is pre-training on 1 billion uh, Instagram images where uh, we took a subset of 1500 hashtags that were selected to match the ImageNet classes. And so that's what we pre-train on and then we fine tune on, on ImageNet. Um, and what you find is that this leads to a massive improvement in, uh, in terms of accuracy, uh, right? So the exact same model by doing this, um, this pre-training gets you to an accuracy of 84.2%. Uh, um, in these cases, we don't do any, any selection of, uh, of hashtags, but we use larger, uh, larger data sets. Um, and so in particular, the bar on the right is sort of the, the largest experiment that we did where we trained on the full three and a half billion images with these 17,000 hashtags, um, and you get the same score of, of 84.2%. We also looked at larger versions of the ImageNet uh, data sets. Um, so the standard benchmark on ImageNet is looking at a thousand classes, but you can actually define more, uh, more complex classification problems that contain more classes. And so we also looked at versions where you have 5,000 and, and 9,000 classes, and you see basically the same effects there. Right, that this pre-training on, on super noisy, very weakly supervised uh, hashtag supervision is really helping these, uh, these models uh, learn better features and as a result, uh, make better predictions on these ImageNet tasks. 
Now, what's, what's interesting, or one of the, the most interesting results of this study is probably this uh, figure, where, again, on the y-axis, you're looking at ImageNet top one accuracy. Um, so higher is better. Um, and so ImageNet is still the, the transfer task. Um, and on the x-axis, you're looking at model capacity. So this is basically a measure of like the size of the convolutional network that we're training, measured in terms of the number of uh, multiplication addition operations that the model has to perform to make a forward pass. Um, and so the gray line is sort of standard ImageNet training. And so what you see in that line is that as you make your models larger, you get uh, a, uh, an improvement in accuracy. Um, and this is something that's been observed in a lot of studies um, that typically larger convolutional networks tend to produce better, um, better performance. But now if you look at the, the purple line, uh, what you see there is, you, you know, you also see this improvement. Um, however, the improvement is much bigger, right? So um, um, when you do sort of this pre-training on, on billions of weekly supervised images, your model actually benefits much more from uh, increasing the capacity of, um, of the model. Um, and so that's a really, uh, really interesting result. In particular, what it's suggesting is that the models that we're training here, even though they're really large, um, they're still underfitting. Um, the best result that we have, uh, that we got here was 85.4%. And this is basically, for a long time, this was the state of the art on, on ImageNet. I think there are some studies that report slightly better results yet, but this is basically you know, about uh, the best you can do. And these models are actually available in the PyTorch hub. So you can go on the PyTorch hub, you can download these models and you can use them for, uh, uh, for your own research. They're definitely still the best publicly available models out there for a task like ImageNet. Um, an, another thing that's, that's interesting to look at is basically what is the effect of the number of training images in the source task, right? So in this hashtag supervision task on the, uh, the final accuracy. And if you, if you do that, you see, uh, you get plots like this. Uh, so these are plots for four different target tasks. So the three, three different image net tasks, as well as a bird recognition task. And what you see in all these plots is basically that you know, performance of the model improves as you increase um, the uh, amount of training images. And it increases, uh, the performance improves in a, in a fairly predictable way, right? Which is, which is kind of nice because it means that, you, you know, you can almost predict what will happen as you, um, as you double the number of, of training images in a, in a training model. Cool. So, so, so these are some of the, uh, the, the results that I wanted to, to show you from, um, from this study. And really, you know, if you start looking at these models, you know, they work really well, right? I, and I think that's a big difference compared to, let's say, when I was doing my uh, PhD and, and I was working on, on computer vision as well. Basically, back in the day, you know, nothing really worked. Um, and what's different here is that these models are really starting to work well. They, they're really starting to recognize stuff, which which raises a whole set of new questions. Um, and in particular, uh, one of the questions we've been, we've been asking ourselves is, does image recognition, do these models, do they work for, for everyone? Um, and this is a study that we, that we did with, uh, uh, with Terence DeVries, who was an intern at, at, at FAIR, um, and Cheng Han and, and Isha. So if you start digging into these models, um, and you give them images like this of, um, you, you know, uh, soap or spices or, or toothpaste. Um, and you ask, you, you know, sort of modern cloud services. So things like, you know, Google Cloud Vision API or, or IBM Watson um, or the, the, uh, the Amazon uh, Azure service or like AWS, uh, sorry, AWS service um, uh, for image recognition then all these services give very good predictions, right? So they'll predict things like toiletry and spice and, and toothpaste, which is exactly what is depicted on the, on the images. And so, you know, if you take these kinds of images, uh, which originate from the UK or, or the US, um, the models seem to work really well. Um, and so you may conclude, well, you know, maybe this image classification is problem is more or less solved. 
But what happens as you, uh, when you change the images, so for instance, rather than um, inputting a, a soap image that is, was made in the UK, you use an image uh, of soap that was made in Nepal, or you photograph uh, spice containers that were, that were photographed in the Philippines, um, or toothpaste in, in Burundi, suddenly um, the predictions start to be completely off, right? Um, and so these systems don't do a good job in, in recognizing in this case, uh, I guess, bar soap, or you know, they seem to be unaware that uh, spice containers are, are very different in the Philippines than they are in the US. Um, or in the case of toothpaste, you, you know, they're presumably not only looking at uh, the toothpaste container itself, but also at the, the context around it, right? So they don't recognize the toothpaste out of the, the context that, uh, that these models expect or have learned to expect, which is like a sort of a wide bathroom uh, type situation. So we decided to dig more into this. And in particular, we, we did an experiment on uh, using a data set called Dollar Street which is a photo collection gathered by Gapminder, which is a, a Swedish nonprofit um, that is basically trying to give more insight into how people across the world live. Um, and so the, the photos are things like, are photos like the ones you see on the slide here. And these photos are annotated by object class. So there are around 117 classes of different household items. Um, in this case, you're looking at, uh, at toilets. Um, and they're also annotated for the country in which the photograph was made, as well as for the household income of the family in which the, the objects were, were photographed. And in total, there are around 20,000 photos in this, um, in this data set, uh, and as I said, 117 classes. And what we did is we, um, we measured the accuracy of these cloud vision systems on this data set. Um, and in particular, what I'm showing here is the average top five accuracy of, um, of five image recognition systems. So Amazon Recognition, Google Cloud Vision, Clarify, Microsoft Azure, and, and IBM Watson. Um, and um, the, the color basically represents the accuracy of the system on the photos from that country, right? Where uh, uh, dark green uh, corresponds to an accuracy of around 90%. Yellow corresponds to an accuracy of around 75%, and red corresponds to an accuracy of, of 60%. And so what you see is that these, these models and these systems are working really well in, you know, in North America and in, in European countries, but they're, um, they work well in, in Turkey as well. Um, so good for you guys. Uh, but they already start to work less well in, in, in Russia, in Southeast Asia, and they particularly uh, perform poorly in, in parts of South America as well as, as Africa. And, and the difference in accuracy are really huge, right? They're really sort of a 30% difference between, you know, let's say 90% in the, in the US and 60% accuracy in, uh, in Somalia. And, you know, the other thing that this data set allows you to do is it, it allows you to measure accuracy basically as a function of, of family income. And so there what you see is that um, the accuracy of these systems is, um, is correlated with the income in which uh, the family income um, um, of the, the, the income of the family in which the objects were, uh, were photographed. And interestingly, this is not just um, a result of income correlating to country or geographic location, because if you split out the results for a country like India, in which, which is a country in which you have a, a, a, large, um, a large diversity in, in family incomes, you actually within India see, uh, uh, see similar effects as well, um, where these systems work better for, uh, for high income households than they do for low income households. So why does this happen? I think there are sort of, you know, there are a whole bunch of problems, but, but two sort of really stand out. Um, the first one is that the data set collection for uh, a lot of, of modern image recognition systems relies primarily on services that are popular in the West. So on services like, uh, like Flickr, uh, which are used in some countries, but, but not in other countries. Um, and probably the, the, the second one, um, and, and maybe the most important one, is that most data set collection starts with English queries. Um, and that can really introduce, you know, large variations in, um, in the types of data that you're collecting. 
So for instance, if you go on Flickr and you search for the word wedding, then you'll find images like the one you see in the top row, uh, where you have a, a bride in a, in a white gown and a, and a groom in a, in a smoking or suit. However, if you were to search for the Hindi word for wedding, um, also on Flickr, you'd find images like the ones in, in the bottom row, uh, where people were very different, uh, uh, where, where couples were very different types of, of clothing, uh, uh, much more colorful and visually very different from um, sort of the wedding pictures you see in the top row. Similarly, if you'd search for spices, um, you know, you find images of these uh, spice containers, like typically like, you know, transparent plastic uh, containers. Whereas if you search for the Hindi word for spices, you'll uh, find visually very differently looking images of, um, of spices. Right. And so what what this is uh, is showing or like what these results are, are suggesting is that there is really still, you know, like as image classification is, is starting to work, there's still a lot of work for uh, for all of us to do to make sure that these systems actually work for um, uh, for everyone and and serve all their users, uh, serve all their users well. So, so that's what I wanted to, um, to tell you about some of the work that we're doing on, on visual recognition. In, in the second half of the talk, I want to talk a little bit about visual understanding, which is basically this idea of like, you know, let's suppose that visual recognition, uh, so things like image classification or image detection, let's suppose that they actually work. What do we do next, right? Like what, how do we go from there to actually understanding image content at a higher level than just you know classif classification or um, or detection, and one of the big questions that come up comes up there is this question of how do we measure image understanding, right? So if we have a system that has visual understanding, you know how do we actually confirm that that's that that's the case? Um, and a, a, a popular approach uh, to doing this is to define this task of visual question answering, which is basically this proposal where you are given an image and you're given a question about that image um, and you have to answer the question. And this seems like a really reasonable uh, proposal, right? So like if you uh, have a system that really understands an image, then you should be able to answer any type, uh, any question about that, that image that is thrown at the system. Um, and so this, this proposal uh, got a lot of attention and, and gained a lot of popularity over, um, over the past couple of years. Um, and so, so we started working a little bit on, on visual question answering as well. Um, and typically the way these models work is, you know, they'll take an image, they'll feed the image through some convolutional network, which produces some, uh, some image features. And then uh, they take the question, they feed it through uh, some type of language model, which at the time used to be typically an LSTM model. Uh, more recently, it would probably be a transformer uh, type architecture. And that architecture would create some question features. And then they would train some kind of classifier on top of this, which could be a logistic regressor or, or a slightly more uh, uh, complex model that uh, basically predicts uh, what the answer is. Um, and so we, we played around with these models um, on a collection of 70,000 multiple choice questions. And, um, um, at the time, the, the state of the art on that data set was basically to, you know, use this, uh, use this model um, where you encode the question with an LCM, you encode the image with a convolutional network, and then to measure the percentage of correct answers, which was around 52% uh, percent at the time. Um, so this is a task where you have a, a multiple choice task with four possible answers. And so uh, the chance level is 25%, right? And so these systems definitely learn to, to do something, right? Like they definitely do better than, uh, than chance. Um, but we started to wonder like, you know, do these systems actually work and, and what do they really learn? Um, and in particular, um, we were motivated by this story of Clever Hans. Um, so, so this is Clever Hans. Um, he is a horse uh, that lived in the early 1900s in, uh, in Germany. And he was a really amazing horse um, because what he was able to do, he was able to solve um, arithmetic assignments. Um, so for instance, if you would go to Hans and you would ask him, how much is three plus four? 
then Hans would tap his leg seven times. Um, now, of course, Hans's owner saw a, a business opportunity here. Um, and so um, his owner would take this, uh, this horse to, uh, to markets all across Germany, which is, which is where the horse lived. And uh, in, in return for, uh, for some payments, you, you know, he would entertain crowds at, um, at these markets with this, amazing, uh, with this amazing horse. Now, of course, there were some, some people who were, uh, who were suspicious of this, right? Like, how was, how was this horse able to, um, to uh, you know, figure out what three plus four is? And uh, so there were some folks who, who did research into, okay, what is the, what is the strategy that, that the horse learned to employ here? And in 1907, uh, a researcher by the name of Oscar Fungst uh, unraveled the mystery. So it turned out that the horse had developed the, the following uh, strategy. The horse would wait until the question was answered. And then the horse would start tapping his leg until the crowd started cheering. And then he would stop. And this way, the horse got every question that it was asked correct. Um, and so, so, you know, so, so why am I telling this story? Well, the, the reason I'm telling it is because it teaches us a lesson, right? It teaches us that um, even if a, um, a sim, if a system appears to display intelligent behavior, it doesn't mean it's actually, you know, intelligent or has learned to, um, to sort of execute the, the underlying strategy or the underlying policy that you were expecting it to, um, uh, to execute. Um, and so what we started wondering is, you know, are these VQA systems, like, are we building horses there? Like, are these kind of like clever Hanses? So we did the following experiments. We took the multiple choice visual question and we threw away the image and we threw away the question. So we would only keep the four answers and we would encode these answers using word to fact features and then train a binary classifier to predict whether or not the answer was correct. Right, so we just take an answer and say, yes, this is the answer, or no, this is not the answer. And then at test time, we would predict the highest scoring answer. And lo and behold, um, this actually got us to 52.9%, right? And so this is a model that arguably, you know, has no under visual understanding whatso whatsoever, right? Which, which raises some questions around, um, you, you know, sort of how to do these kinds of evaluations, right? So what is going wrong here is that in the collection of, um, of, of data sets like these VQA data sets, it turns out to be really difficult to not introduce um, all sorts of, of weird biases. So for instance, if you give me two options and the options are snow or leaves, um, I can tell you right now that the answer is going to be snow. And the reason is that if these are the two answers, then the question is going to be what is covering the ground? And uh, the question, what is covering the ground, is only going to be asked by uh, mechanical turkers, by, by humans, if there is snow on the ground. They won't ask that question when there are leaves on the ground. Right? And so the main takeaway here is that developing um, benchmarks like visual question answering benchmarks is actually really difficult. It's really complicated to, to do it well. And so as a field, we need to get much better in, in sort of figuring out what are the rights, uh, how do we design sort of good benchmarks for visual understanding. Um, and so one of the, the things that, that we worked on on our end is this, this sort of more um, um, uh, artificial uh, visual question answering task called, called Clever, um, in which you have images like this and, and questions like, are there an equal number of large things and, and metal spheres? And because this is a synthetic data set, we were basically able to control all biases, to basically develop it in a way that a horse, uh, a clever Hans-like system, um, is, is not capable of solving clever. Um, and so this is an interesting, um, an interesting benchmark if you're, um, if you're sort of working in this space, it may be worth looking at. Now, visual question answering is not, is not sort of the only, only task or, or, or type of way in which you can can study visual understanding or, or try and go beyond visual recognition. Um, another example is, is image caption. Um, so this is this task where, you know, given an image, you are asked to uh, assign, uh, uh, a, uh, like describe the image using a caption. Now, the, 
here we sort of found similar problems. Evaluating the relevance of captions to images is actually really difficult, right? And so um, to, to give you an example of that, here's an, here's an image uh, that was made in, in New York. And um, for instance, if I, if I produce, if I take a system and I produce the caption, a bunch of luggage sitting on top of a floor, uh, which was actually a prediction by, uh, by one of the, the modern captioning systems, this uh, caption gets a CIDR D score of 55.9, um, which is, you know, the CIDR scores are, are very hard to interpret, but it basically means like this is a pretty good caption for the image. That's what the CIDR scores say. Now, I'm a New Yorker, so I know that this is not a bunch of luggage sitting on top of a floor, uh, but that this is a pile of garbage sitting next to a trash can, uh, which unfortunately is a, is a common sight in New York. And if you produce this caption um, and you measure the CIDR D score of the caption, you get a score of 0.14, which basically means like this caption is completely wrong according to the evaluation measure. Um, so we looked into this a bit more. And in particular, we, we did a study where we asked people to rate the correctness of a caption to an image on a Likert scale. And uh, so the scale goes from one to five, where one is the caption is completely wrong and five is the question is, is completely correct. And then uh, we basically, uh, we, we laid out um, the, um, the we, we met the relation of these caption measures. So things like CIDR, uh, but also blue score or meteor or spice against these correctness scores. And if you do that, you get plots like this where you see that there's only a very small correlation between um, these captioning scores um, and, and the, the actual human evaluations of, of, uh, of correctness, right? Which means that, you know, it's really dangerous to start building a captioning system aiming to optimize one of these measures, right? Because, you know, you really don't know what you're, what you're optimizing. And so we started looking at at different ways of, of framing the problem. Um, and one way of, uh, of framing the problem is to think about it instead of captioning, to think about it in terms of image retrieval, right? So to think about it in terms of a task where you get a text query, like a person wearing a banana headdress and, and legless, um, and then you have to retrieve an image that contains, uh, that contains this query. Um, so you can do this on, uh, on captioning data sets. But it turns out this doesn't work very, uh, very well. And the reason it doesn't work very well is because, um, you know, for uh, in this kind of task, you typically know what the positive image is, and you, but you don't know anything about all the um, other images in the data set. You're just sort of assuming that they're they're negative. But as it turns out, even in a data set like Coco Captions, there are actually multiple photos of a person wearing a banana headdress, which seems like a pretty low probability event, but still there are multiple photos. And so you may pick uh, an image that indeed contains a person conta wearing a banana headdress, but it may still be counted as incorrect, right? And so the problem here is that in image retrieval, you have positive annotations, but no negative annotations, which makes evaluation really hard. So to try and address this, we developed a, a task called binary image selection where we basically take this idea of, um, um, of image retrieval, right? So again, you get a text query, but now what we do is in addition to the text query, you get two images that are uh, very similar, uh, but only one is described by the uh, text query and the other one's not, right? So for instance, the text query could be plates full with carrots and beets on a white table. Um, and in this case, only the right image is correct. Right, uh, the left image also contains a plate with carrots, uh, but it's only one plate and there are no beats, right? And so that image is incorrect. Or similarly, you know, if the text query is yellow shirt, a tennis player looking for incoming ball, um, we'll have these two images, uh, one of a yellow shirt, a tennis player, and the other one of, uh, of also a tennis player, uh, but a tennis player who's not wearing a yellow shirt and who's not looking for an incoming ball. Um, and so this, um, this task allows you to, um, to sort of measure much more reliably the accuracy of, uh, of systems like this, because now you, you know what the positive image is and you know what the negative image is. 
And also it focuses more on fine grained details, right? It's, uh, it focuses on sort of, you know, subtle differences between these, uh, these images that are semantically important. Um, you, can, you can download these annotations. So we have Bison annotations basically for like the Coco captions uh, uh, images. You can download them from, uh, from GitHub if you want to play with this yourself. Um, and in the, um, in the study, we did a, an evaluation of a bunch of uh, modern captioning and, and image retrieval systems. And what we find there is that, you know, there's definitely some signal in, in things like Blue Insider. Um, but they don't, uh, they don't give a very realistic view of, um, of how well these systems work, right? So modern captioning systems in terms of CIDR score work much better than, are much better than humans at, at captioning systems. At least that's what the scores uh, suggest. But if you start looking at the actual results, like it's very clear that this is not, uh, not the case. And that's something that's accurately captured by, uh, by Bison. Um, which basically shows that there's like a 15 point difference between the performance of, um, um, of captioning systems or image retrieval systems and the performance of, of humans, which is 100% by, because of the way we designed the task. The last bit of work uh, I want to show you on, on visual understanding is, is work on a benchmark called FIRE. Um, and so in this benchmark, what we try to do is we try to go a little bit beyond just images and we try to go from visual understanding to more physical understanding or physical reasoning. Um, and the, the way we do that is by defining tasks like this. Um, okay, are we back, Hamdi? Does yes. this work? Okay, yes, no, yes. let's hope it continues working. It's For some reason, it's throwing me out of the Zoom meeting. I don't know what's going on. Um, okay, so, so in this task, you, you know, you have to place a, uh, a red ball in the world. Um, so for instance, you can place this ball and then the simulator will play. Um, and lo and behold, this is a solution to the task, right? It touches the, uh, the green ball. Um, I will, I'll play it again just for your, uh, for your entertainment. Um, it, it starts moving the green ball and then it moves the, the glass a little bit to the right so that the green ball can fall into uh, the glass and, and touch the, uh, the blue ball. Right, so, so really the, the task here is always the same. Make sure that the green ball touches either the purple thing or the, or, or the blue thing. Um, and so you start from an initial scene. You are placing a, uh, uh, you're doing an action, um, then the simulation runs. And um, um, uh, based on the result of the simulation, you uh, get a signal on whether you solved the task or whether you did not solve the task. Um, and so the, uh, what we did is we developed a lot of these tasks and the solution strategies that you need in order to solve the tasks are very diverse. Um, so you may have to build little things like catapults or you have to um, um, sort of, you, you, you know, sort of, hit a, uh, a green ball that's falling to make it sure <coughs> to make sure that it's moving in the right direction, um, et cetera. Um, and we, we really developed a large number of these tasks. Um, in total, there are about uh, 50 tasks, um, 25 uh, tasks that can be solved by placing a single red ball. These are the tasks that you see on the left. And there are 25 tasks that can be solved by uh, placing two balls in the world. So in that case, so, uh, placing a single red ball is insufficient, but you need to place two balls that somehow, that somehow interact. Um, and for each of these tasks, they are actually programmatic templates. Um, so we can actually generate many, many tasks that are uh, almost the same to, uh, to the task that you, you see here. And in total, the data set contains a hundred of these templates for each of the tasks that you see here, right? So they're um, in the, uh, the tier for a single ball, there are 25 times 100 um, uh, tasks, part of which you can use for training and, and then the remainder you can use for testing. We designed this, this benchmark in a way that the task cannot be solved well by random search. So if you look at the percentage of tasks that are solved by random search um, on the y-axis as a function of the number of random attempts, what you see is that you need, you know, 10,000 or, uh, or, or maybe even 100,000 
um, um, actions uh, through random sampling before you find an action that, that actually solves, uh, that solves the task. Um, and so we've been doing experiments with, with, um, with reinforcement learning models. So things like deep Q networks, et cetera, on, um, on this fire benchmark. And what we find is that the agents are still very far away from, from doing optimal ranking, right? So, um, so models that work well on things like Atari games, like the DQN model, they don't actually work very well on, um, on fire. Where, so in these plots um, on the y-axis, you're looking at basically a kind of area under success rate curve. Um, so higher is better. You can sort of compare it to an AUC um, under an ROC curve. Um, and the gray line is basically, you know, sort of optimal ranking of, of action. So this is what an optimal ranking agent would, uh, would attain. And then the other, um, the other colors are, um, color lines correspond to, to other agents. And so what you see is that an agent like the DQN agent is, is far below what, what an optimal ranking agent would, uh, would get, right? And so in a task like FIRE, even though it's a very simple uh, task and as a human, you can learn to play it very, uh, uh, very quickly, um, you, you know, sort of current reinforcement learning agents are, are still very far away from, um, uh, from human performance or, or sort of what is optimal. So, so to conclude, um, so what I've tried to do is give you a little bit of an overview of, of our work on visual uh, recognition. And what you see there is that, you know, visual recognition is really, it's starting to work, um, but this leads to, to new questions as well. And in particular, you know, we have to take a lot of care to make sure that uh, the, the models that we're training don't have um, undesired biases and actually work for for all the, the people that would want to use them, right? And I think this is really a change in, in machine learning over the past couple of years where, you know, because stuff is starting to work now, you know, we really have to care about, you know, how uh, models and systems are, are used and who is using them and, and who is benefiting from them, et cetera. Um, and then I've talked about, you know, some of the work that we're doing to going towards visual understanding. And, and I think, Sort of, you know, if there's one takeaway from uh, from that work is that you know this is still really difficult, right? Like we don't, we're still trying to figure out like what are the right benchmarks, what are the right ways to measure progress on on visual understanding, um, and and you know, sort of that's the stage that we're uh, that we're in, and so it's a really exciting time to to be working on um, on these kinds of problems. Um, so that's sort of what I wanted to present. I hope we'll have some time for, uh, for questions and, and thank you very much. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, it, it was a very nice, interesting talk. So we have a better idea now, I think, uh, what's happening in Facebook AI research. Uh, we have some questions. Uh, I would like to start with the ones uh, related to GDPR. So. Uh, are some participants are asking about uh, how you deal with this GDPR uh, permissions. So, in, more specifically, uh, DZ Dinchkol is asking how to data regulations such as GDPR affect AI research at Facebook. Do you have any comment on this? Um, I mean, I'm not a GDPR expert. Um, I mean, they, they, you know, like all our research is GDPR compliant. Um, that's what I can say, right? So, for instance, in this in this Instagram study that we showed, uh, there are actually no images of. So we only use public images, um, right? So like there's a there's a privacy sort of you know there's a bunch of different privacy settings. We didn't use any images from European users um, in order to be GDPR compliant. Um, it, you know, other than that, I there's not much I can say, like I'm no, no expert on, um, on GDPR, but we have very rigorous um, sort of internal vetting processes to make sure that all the research and, and all the product work that we do is compliant with uh, regulations like GDPR, as well as other um, sort of privacy uh, uh, regulations that may apply. Okay, so one more related question. So this one is about like, do you collect the data based on your application or your task in the first place or you design your tasks based on the data you have in facebook um 
I mean, you know, like in a study like the ones that one I showed, I mean, we're we're being pragmatic, right? It's like, um, I don't I don't know if there are any, you know, I, but I think that's true for all research, right? Like, why are people, you know, why are researchers doing um, doing this thing where they pre-train on on ImageNet and then fine tune on other tasks, right? It's because you know ImageNet is available. By the way, ImageNet has all sorts of problems. Um, it contains pornographic images. It contains racist images. It has weird racist uh, racist biases. Um, it contains images of people who did not consent um, uh, to use of those images. And so, you, you know, in many ways, actually, you know, using ImageNet may may be sort of the more uh, problematic part of the um, uh, of the study. Why do people do it? I mean, you know, in part, it's because that's what's available, right? Like they're being pragmatic, and that's the that's the same for uh, for us. But I don't know if we make, you know, I don't know if we make actual design choices, right? Like, you know, in particular, we don't influence the the uh, the collection of the data that we use for this Instagram study. Okay, thank you. So another question. Um, one of the participants asked for, like, how do you see the future of visual understanding using representation learning, including generative models or contrastive learning in self-supervised frameworks? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, y you know, sort of if you look at, um, at self-supervised learning, right, which is sort of one of the the, the, the large popular things in, in the community right now, then I think it's fair to say that, you, you, you know, at least up till now, sort of these contrastive approaches uh, work better than, um, than generative modeling. Um, we did some work ourselves on this. We had a, uh, we had a method called Perl, uh, which I didn't, uh, didn't talk about in, um, in this talk, which is basically a, a contrastive, uh, uh, method and that, that is producing good uh, was producing good results at the time. Um, colleagues of mine are, are still working in this space and, and producing new models there. Um, all of those are are contrastive models, although some of the more recent ones are actually not right. Um, in particular, sort of the most recent paper out of Facebook AI, which is a method called Swath which I wasn't involved in, but it's more of a, a clustering based methods, right? So it's a little bit more of a hybrid between, um, between contrastive, um, uh, between contrastive learning and, and, you know, some degree of generation, I guess, right? Like where the generation is an assignment to some kind of like cluster or some sort of course, uh, semantic thing. It's, it's hard to say where it's, uh, where that is going. I mean, f I, I don't think it'll be full pixel generation. Like it's never been clear to me why, you know, sort of full pixel generation is the right thing to focus on because, you know, most of the variations in, uh, pixel values are actually not semantically meaningful, right? It's like, you know, there are things like, um, you know, lighting differences or, um, or things like, you know, contrast differences and so on, right? Like these can have massive impacts on, uh, on pixel values, but they don't change any of the, um, of the semantic content. And so those are the kinds of variations that, you know, if your goal is to learn good semantic features, you want to be invariant to those variations, right? And, and I think in the, you know, my concern is that in a generative model, you're always trying to learn um, to learn to capture in your representations these variations as well, right? So you're modeling variations that you know you want to be invariant under. And I think that's sort of what, what is making the, the recent contrastive learning methods work, right? Like really what they say is, you, you know, if you have an image and you have this transformed version of the image, um, you know, lighting changed, contrast changed, um, you, you, you know, we took sort of a, a patch out of it, then the representation that the model produces needs to be invariant under that transformation, right? Because we, so it's basically saying like, we know that transformation doesn't change the semantic content of the image. And so as a result, like we know that the features must be, must be the same, which, which seems really uh, reasonable. And I, I think it's one of the reasons why 
contrastive learning works. At the same time, there, there are also many problems with contrastive learning, right? Like the main problem is probably that, you know, learning is just really inefficient because for every example that you feed through the network of like an image and a transformed version of that image, you only get one bit of information, right? It's basically saying like, these are similar, these are not similar, right? And so the, the learning I think is really um, inefficient um, and, and that may be, you know, sort of longer term, that may definitely be a, a, a problem towards making progress with these, these contrastive approaches. At the same time, the progress has been amazingly fast, right? Like if you look over the past year, year and a half in self-supervised learning from, uh, from images, like it's, the numbers are really shooting up in part because many, many people are, are working on it. Um, but, you know, it's definitely been going faster than I had expected uh, a year or a year and a half ago. Thank you very much. So I have a question which is... Uh non-technical but uh, related to Facebook AI research and uh, graduate students. So I, I know that you have graduate programs. I know that it's very competitive. Can you comment on this uh, a bit? Because we have lots of uh, graduate students attending uh, summer school. So maybe better to hear yeah, from so, you. Yeah, so I mean, there are a couple of things that we have, right? It's like um, in Ferris, we have uh, a graduate program Right, so um, we basically have PhD students who work uh, more or less full time at um, at Facebook AI through a program called Cifre, uh, which is somewhat specific to uh, to France. In North America, that is harder. Like basically, U.S. schools are not open to those kinds of programs, and so they're the main mode of collaboration with um, um, with uh, graduate students is through internships, right? Through folks who in particular now, right, like in the summer who um, who come in and intern with us. I think at the moment we probably have 120 or so summer interns, um, right? So there are a lot of graduate students who, who come in and work with us through those programs. And, and actually a lot of the work that I, that I presented today was done by uh, um, interns. Um, so, so, I mean, that, that would sort of be the main way of, um, of collaborating. Um, what's important to keep in mind there, which is maybe a little specific to the US is that, you know, most students do summer internships and there's sort of a fair, a fairly standard timeline there where, you know, students start applying for this in, you know, around October, we'll interview in December, January, maybe early uh, February. Um, and, you know, we'll have intern offers out by, you know, late January through, uh, through early March for sort of the summer the summer season where the summer is sort of late May to late um, August is typically, so the internships are typically around 16 weeks in, um, in length. So it's important to have that, um, to sort of keep that timeline in mind. Um, like it's it basically like the timeline matches that the, the academic calendar of, of US or Canadian schools, but it may not match that of, of Turkish or, uh, or other European schools as, as well. So that's something to keep in mind. And the other thing is like, you know, obviously like we get a ton of applications for uh, these internships. I cannot not say how many, but you know, there, there are a lot. And, and so one thing is, you know, I would, I would definitely recommend you to be targeted, right? Like don't just apply, uh, but think about like, Hey, you know, who is a researcher who would be really excited to, um, um, um, to work with who, you, you know, like I'm maybe doing related work that's closely related to their, their research and, and reach out to them directly or, you know, try to meet them at, at conferences. Um, I mean, that's obviously a bit harder now in sort of this virtual, virtual setup, but once, you know, in-person conferences resume, like, you, you know, try to meet with some of these folks, tell them about your, uh, your work. Um, and, and try and build some connections because that's often how, um, um, you, you know, sort of how, um, not, not how internship decisions are made, but like it can definitely help you in uh, when you start applying for, for internships. Um, these are paid things, by the way, right? Like they're actually pretty well, uh, well paid. Um, uh, so that's, you know, that's nice as well, I guess. Thank I don't you. know. Does Thank that answer you. your question, Handy? Yeah. So uh, one more thing. I think uh, Selim will ask you one question. 
Um, hi, Lawrence. Uh, thanks hey. a lot for the interesting presentation. Uh, we actually look forward to seeing you at BCANT once this pandemic is over. Um, I'd like to ask about uh, the problem of visual understanding uh, versus eco supervised learning. Um, you mentioned in the first part that um, you're using hashtags uh, for training, and I'm curious about your opinion on uh, how much an algorithm should actually focus on um, the localization of the actual objects versus just getting the, uh, the labels right? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, ultimately for true visual understanding, both are going to be important, right? So like the, I think the current approach of like just training classification models and then, you know, sort of hoping that they work in um, in visual understanding, I think that's a little naive, right? Like there's going to be, you know, let's say things like detection and so on are going to have to be important. Um, for things like, so for the study I showed, like I didn't show those results, but we actually do have detection results as well. Um, and there the results are much more mixed. Um, so what we see is that if you do this, this hashtag uh, uh, pre-training that you know, the detection, uh, that detection systems are getting less good at localization, but if they localize well, they're getting better at classifying what is in the box, um, right? So like, you know, like basically it helps classification, but it hurts localization, which you can sort of, um, which you can sort of understand, right? Because, you, you know, in these classification tasks, like really you're training the model to, to try and be invariant for under the location of an object that you're you're trying to recognize, right? Um, so, so I think I mean that's maybe one one uh, thing related to your your question. The other thing that's been interesting is that we do see with systems like this, we do see a lot of improvements in certain sort of visual understanding tasks, right? So tasks like image captioning in particular. Um, so if you take the uh, the models that we open source and you use them to fine tune a, a captioning system on something like Coco Captions, you actually get way better results. And the, the improvements are actually much bigger in image captioning than they are in image classification on, on ImageNet. And the reason is probably because these systems at training time, they just see a much larger visual variety, right? Like both in terms of sort of, you know, the number of classes, that they see, but also in terms of sort of the, the visual differences um, or the difference in visual appearance that they that they observe at, at training time. And this really seems to be helping them at um, in, in sort of captioning. Um, so there's a study by uh, Jason Weston and colleagues that that basically takes these these models and tries them out for um, for captioning. So so there's definitely some um, some benefit on, on some of these tasks, uh, but not necessarily all. And indeed localization is probably, um, uh, one of the, uh, one of the issues there. I mean, I think what's been holding back that type of work, right. Is that, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the detection work, at least until recently focused on a task like Coco, right. Like where you have 80 different objects, which is, for detection, right, which is simply not enough, I think, to really sort of make the make the step towards, you know, sort of full visual understanding, right? Like I think a Cocoa system will know about, will be able to localize fire hydrants and giraffes, but maybe that's not, you know, that's maybe not sufficient, right? And so, so I think part of the effort in the in the detection community is is going into the development of um, of new data sets that. Uh, cover a much larger number of classes. Um, one example of that would be the Elvis uh, data set that, that was released by, by Facebook uh, uh, uh, some time ago, right? Like that's really sort of trying to, um, trying to increase the number of classes considered in, in detection problems. And that may maybe change this, um, this as well, right? Like as those detection systems are starting to work, like, you know, maybe they will start to help in things like visual question answering or visual captioning, et cetera. Thanks a lot. Okay, so um, thanks a lot, Lawrence, uh, for your Thank time. You. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, next time we would manage to have you physically here. Next year in Ankara, sounds <laughs> great. Great. See you guys. Thank you. Thank